Okay, okay so good afternoon, uh, afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Witness, as uh, the chair just pointed out. So I am, I'm going to give my sort of uh, uh, reflections on the, on the presentations that, that have been given. Uh, very interesting uh, presentations. So, so, so for me, I think yeah, uh, the topic of learning to compete, I think that was very, it's a very, very good and very, very sort of timely uh, sort of research uh, intervention. Because obviously, for, for many African countries, when you think of even uh, issues around uh, 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 decent employment, decent growth, uh, or, uh, growth uh, uh, with, with equity, one of the areas where people are looking to is actually sort of developing and strengthening manufacturing would actually help Africa uh, to, 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 to grow in a more balanced way. So one of the things that I think uh, John pointed out uh, or touched on earlier on was that um, the productivity differentials between agriculture and manufacturing is quite huge, uh, which I think many people or many studies have sort of alluded to that. But uh, I've seen some, some recent work uh, which uh, sort of looking at uh, trying to measure productivity per hour spent rather than productivity where you divide output by the number of, of, of total hours. So, so if, you, if you take that route, so for example, I know Chris Barrett from uh, Cornell, they have done quite a bit of work around that. And, and actually the differential is not that huge if you look at uh, productivity per hour. So it's essentially, uh, because most of the time in agriculture, uh, you, you have a productive season, especially in Africa, you have productive season and non-productive season. So when you take a productivity, the usual way we measure it, we look at for the, probably for the year, which means you are including the period where there's no, no real activity. So as a result, you find a huge disparity. But again, it's something that is uh, debatable. So, so on the issue of uh, exporting behavior of firms, um, and why some firms export and others don't. Um, well, so, so I think one of the issues that was pointed out was that um, if, if, if you push a firm to export, it's likely to survive or it's likely to remain in the export market. And, and that, that's very good and that's very encouraging. But of course, what I would have wanted to hear more of is, uh, so uh, as a policymaker, for example, so how do you actually push the firm into the export market? I, I think that's an area that uh, perhaps needs to further investigation uh, uh, but I think that's a, probably from a policy point of view, it's very, very important to understand if you were to go to a policymaker, uh, what do we tell them? So yes, it's good to know that the firms, if you, they enter, they are likely to survive. And, and I think there is this, uh, obviously, issues around these stresses uh, might, might also come into play there. But I think the challenge is how do we actually, in the first place, get them in? So I, th I think that's one of the big issues that we, we might need to think of in terms of research development going forward. Um, Okay, so, so that's one thing. So, so then on the issue of um, uh, 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 FDI, uh, that FDI is important, there's evidence of spillover effects, which is great. And, and, and obviously, so, so one of the things is, of course, we, what, what I would have, what, one thing that I sort of uh, thought about was um, in looking at, um, we, have, we had, we had uh, Vietnam and we had Kenya. And, and of course, one of the things that was pointed out was that um, more direct, uh, more engagement or direct interaction between export um, MNEs and local firms in Vietnam than, in, for example, Kenya, where you tend to have more interaction among MNEs. Uh, so sort of is probably understandable. It's probably something that you can intuitively sort of anticipate. But but if I think of uh, Africa, also the point that John was making that Africa is heterogeneous. So so I would have actually sort of wanted to see the the results for Tunisia, where you have a big component of or a big share of manufacturing GDP. Probably it might correlate very closely with, uh, with Vietnam. I would do the same for South Africa, where there's uh, already a strong industrial base. So, so that the, the engagement between the, the MN is, so the, essentially there's sort of a natural, because you already have some big local firms who are also uh, producing and probably themselves exporting. So if you bring in MNEs, you have a greater likelihood of getting more interaction between the two than when, when you have a very sort of different types of firms where maybe the, the, the local firms are very micro and then the MNE is so the, probably the interaction will be much limited. So I think looking at uh, giving examples, maybe you, I, I would have benefited from a, a present, if, if you had included the examples of Tunisia, for example, South Africa. Um, but, but, but I think it's also encouraging that uh, where you, to, to know that where you have a better interaction then you tend to get better outcomes in terms of productivity. So I, th I think it's something, again, that uh, from a policy point of view would be interesting. So, 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 
So, so and also I was just thinking as I was sitting there, the issue of uh, getting African firms to participate in global value chains. Because that, I think that is also one way where you can uh, increase the engagement of African firms with international firms and also probably encourage learning uh, from these uh, uh, firms. I'm doing okay. Okay, that's good. Okay. So, so on, on agglomeration issues, um, so it's, it's actually sort of interesting, again, the results. So of course, most of them sort of confirm to what uh, 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 a priori I would sort of expect. Um, so, so what was sort of uh, probably interesting uh, for, for me and for probably from a policy point of view also is the fact that uh, clustering does not necessarily, uh, is not necessarily the best option for all types of, for all firms. So I, I thought that was very, very interesting. Uh, because probably sometimes we just promote clustering, but but again, maybe one might want to take it a bit further and sort of try to figure out. So what does that mean from a policy point of view? Uh, so 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 probably it's uh, it's uh, because from the presentation it came out as uh, small firms may not benefit as much. True, but the question is whether we are talking of clustering of all types of firms, or you can also have clusters of uh, different size firms. So, so you could, from a policy point of view, probably the recommendation might come across as, well, so it's, it might not be very helpful to cluster uh, big, small firms. So you might actually want to think of a strategy which encourages clustering of firms of more or less the same size, which, which would allow probably then, of course, you want competition to be tough because if you want to be, to, to be exporting or to end export markets, then you need to be, to, to be very competitive. So, so that aspect is good. But obviously, you also want to have a situation where the smaller firms uh, are not necessarily put um, to compete head on with the very big firms where they don't stand a chance. So maybe it might be that uh, actually having different types of clusters might sort of resolve the tension between the small and the large firms. Then, then I, I also just want to sort of emphasize the points that, uh, that um, uh, John sort of uh, on his second shot uh, was, was, was raising which is uh, some of the sort of uh, policy failures uh, sort of in terms of why we have sort of seen deindustrialization in Af Africa, which is of course the fact that uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, people have paid or the policymakers have paid very little attention to infrastructure. And obviously what it does, it raises the cost of uh, moving uh, 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 goods, especially if you think of manufacturing, because you have to move things physical, physically. Then of course the issue of skills, I think that's a challenge, which again in part can be attributed to some of the consequences or the, yeah, the consequences of the structural adjustment programs. Then of course the issue of firm capabilities and, and of course the issue of climate, investment climate. So, so, so one of the things that um, I just want to, to, to speak to is of course in terms of um, Yes. So in terms of building firm capabilities, I, th I think this is an area where, again, it's not clear how, how government or how policymakers can actually come in to, to assist firms uh, in, in building capabilities. But, uh, but again, the issue of uh, 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 ensuring that firms adopt uh, global best practice in production, uh, which in most cases is not just about the physical uh, or technology, but actually the, the softer skills. Which, uh, in my sort of, uh, sort of, uh, at least in um, uh, when I used to work in government, so we had some uh, tours of where we were sort of going to check to see what's happening in some of the small firms, and and obviously, uh, so I think the, in, in that aspect, the government was sort of proactive, trying to bring in uh, people from outside the country, where let's say Asia, where they have done these things of sort of. Um, uh, improving the, the, the production line, if you want. So, so essentially, you find that firms actually, even the way people sit in the factory, you can actually, it can make a huge difference. Just the way people, the layout of the factory can make, make a huge difference in terms of your productivity. So, so obviously, I think those, some of these things are very, very important. And of course, one of the issues is, well, you, they have to be funded. So who's going to fund them? Uh, that's one issue. And also, I think the issue of political, political will and also the issue of, I think in the morning session, I think they, it came across very strongly that ideology matters. So sometimes people don't believe that uh, government or policymakers can actually assist. So, so in a way, it, it does affect uh, how much uh, one can achieve. Okay, thank you.
Sorry. <laughs> I would like to thank the presenters for very insightful uh, set of presentations uh, on their papers. Uh, I will just uh, perhaps uh, start by summarizing what we have learned today. We have learned that there are no doubts that export and FDI uh, benefit um, domestic firms, especially firms in developing countries, in terms of productivity and learning. But, however, they have raised a very important point that the paths uh, through which um, firms uh, reach higher levels of productivity and learning are different and they differ by context. What they have also emphasized is that the paths in which domestic firms interact with foreign firms within specific contexts are also very different and it is important to acknowledge um, these different parts of interaction. For example, in the measure that they have constructed for the first time in, in a study, I think, I believe in Vietnam, they have actually uh, established that it uh, matters whether we observe direct or indirect interaction between domestic and foreign firms. And for example, in a study done in the manufacturing sector in Vietnam, they have found that if we use a broader uh, indirect linkage matter, the effect of uh, on productivity from interacting with upstream foreign firms is negative, but actually uh, when we look at the same sample, same set of firms using their direct measure of interaction, they have found a positive, positive effect from interacting uh, with um, upstream foreign firms. Therefore, um, I really appreciated their uh, presentations in terms of emphasizing how important the context is, which is actually um, seen in the, in the way that uh, foreign and domestic firms, they all uh, interact uh, with each other. And it is also bearing serious uh, policy consequences. And I think Mons emphasized that um, uh, we cannot make uh, any generalizations and that policymakers should actually look at specific cases made uh, in each country. Um, yes, and uh, why is it important that we look at the context is because um, uh, at least uh, two of the presenters mentioned that um, uh, actually the largest gains are made by firms who um, enter uh, the exporting uh, sector and who are at the same time linked with foreign direct investments. Um, yeah, and uh, so um, what I would uh, like to perhaps ask or suggest um, in terms of maybe further uh, types of analysis is actually to, to just ask, um, is there a possibility of investigating the level of linkages between domestic farms and the, their buyers in the final markets in a sense, whether they, their primary buyers are somebody they have regular contracts with, with or they even have some ownership share, basically distinguishing between uh, performance of domestic firm depending on the level of vertical integration uh, with respect to their main buyers. And also, uh, as uh, different, as uh, Mons mentioned, that there are different paths of how a firm becomes an exporter. I was wondering if there could be any scope for analyzing how the regulation in destination countries is um, perhaps a hindrance for le less productive firms or a actually a mechanism of uh, making sure that the, that the most competitive firms are the ones who are entering the export market. Okay, this was brief and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Discuss, comments, questions are welcome. If you can be uh, brief, starting from the one, two, three, four, five. Yes, please. Six. Is there a mic going around? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much for the, the very interesting uh, yes. presentation. So my name is Abdullah Isek from uh, Sheikh Antojob University in uh, Dakar, Senegal. So uh, I think one important issue uh, when looking at uh, the comparison between uh, firms that export and those that do not, uh, I think the evidence is, uh, yes, yeah, those that export are more productive than uh, those that do not. And then the question would be, uh, why is that the case? And I think we have uh, two competing uh, arguments, and you tend to focus on one, which is uh, learning by exporting. Meaning, uh, let's say uh, you have uh, the same level of uh, productivity, and then one start exporting, and then uh, because of the competition it faces in the international market, it becomes more 
productive uh, through this process of learning. But there is another argument, which is uh, uh, referred to as the self-selection effect, meaning uh, those firms that export are those that are more productive before starting the export. So my question is, uh, uh, which effect uh, tends to dominate the, the other, and uh, what would be the policy implication for each one of these two effects? And uh, a second question, which is also very quick, is uh, 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 I think uh, one thing that may prevent technology from uh, uh, being transferred from a foreign firm to domestic firms would be a low labor mobility. And I see this as uh, one of the mechanisms through which uh, technology may go from one firm to another. So uh, the fact is that we may not have uh, a large labor mobility or turnover may be preventing uh, this uh, technology transfer uh, within a given country. So exactly uh, what can you say about this uh, labor turnover as a potential uh, mechanism through which uh, technology may be transferred from one firm to another? Thank you. Thank you very much. Justin, proximity to save time. <laughs> well, first, congratulations for a very successful and informative studies. And my question is related to you know, get more information from the empirical studies. And one of the you know, findings from the empirical studies is that in East Asia, the MMCs have a you know, larger interaction with local economies and a more spillover and a technological transfer. And in African country, less. And I think one reason for that might be in, in East Asia, the MMCs are mostly in sectors consistent with local competitive advantages. And I use the you know, East Asian country as an exporting basis. And under that kind of situation, certainly they will have you know, consistent with local competitive advantages and a local firm will be easier to enter, and they also rely on more of the local supplies to build up their supply chains. And in Africa, you know, many of the MMCs are in the natural resource sectors. They are very capital intensive, and uh, since they are so capital intensive, local firm would be harder to enter. And, and so that is, will certainly have less interactions, less technological spillover, or sometimes local you know, MMCs are very small scale and uh, entering into the local markets and they don't have so much technology either. And, and that may also, you know, two types of that. So, so I, I would like to see if you, you know, bring in these ideas, maybe you can find the type of MMC would also be very important where they are coming here to really use as an exporting basis or for resources or for entering into the local market. That's one thing. Thank and you. secondly, also related to, you know, in East Asia, export processing zone are more successful. And in Africa, export processing zone or industrial park were not successful. That may also relate to what I just commented. Because in East Asia, spatial economic zone or industrial parks are in general built to help the country to do export. And but in Africa, we did not see much of using spatial economic zone or industrial park for export, except now in Ethiopia, they started to do that. And once they started to do that, I think they were more successful also, just like in Borodami and also the Eastern industrial parks. In that case, thank you. Thank you very much. In the middle there. Uh, thank you very much for presenters for a very successful lesson for us today. So I am Nguyen Tu Anh, I'm from Vietnam, Central Institute for Economic Management. Uh, I have uh, two small questions. Well, the first question to um, Professor Zon Pace, uh, when uh, you see that uh, exporting uh, firms have a higher productivity, but uh, I'm wondering, uh, can you, do you consider the size in terms of labor? Does matter or not? Because uh, this is a very important question for policymaker to uh, uh, subsidy or to promote uh, SME or to promote uh, small uh, small firm and medium medium um, uh, medium uh, medium term uh, firms 
to graduate to a larger firm. Because if larger firm more productivity, larger firm is uh, tend to export uh, and have a higher profit profitability. So uh, my question is, does the size matter? Size in terms of uh, uh, labor. And the second question is, uh, I uh, return to the command by Professor Justin, uh, m and demand, and m and connection with the local uh, firms. Uh, I have a different, uh, different view of point here. Uh, I think that that's because in Asian countries, uh, uh, m and have a more connection with the domestic firms because they have demand that. If they don't have demand for local supplies, they, they should use their current uh, supplies from their current uh, supply networks, supplying networks. Uh, why they don't have demand in Africa countries? And why they do have demand in Asian countries, especially in China? I think that that is economy of scale. If those are MNEs. They uh, uh, sell all their products in the market near the country, or they have in the proximity uh, around their location. So they have demand to use the local supplies. And if the uh, their market share in the local in the local market or around a neighboring market. Um, uh, countries is small, so they don't need to use local supply from the mm. because they just use the current okay. supply in in the supply in their current supplying Thank networks. Please, yeah. Please. Okay. okay. So now ten seconds. Yeah. So the question is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so when we uh, do empirical studies, to can you? take this, this argument into the consideration. So is the, the sale volume, volume in the, in the producer, in, for example, in Kenya, and the sale volume in Vietnam does matter for the, the connection with the local suppliers. Thank you. Yeah. That side now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I also enjoyed the presentations a lot. Um, just some quick questions for Mr. John Rand. Um, you spoke about the importance of linkages and complexities, you know, in industry, the Hirschman linkages in terms of um, uh, capturing um, the benefits of, you know, spillovers and knowledge transfer. I was just wondering, um, Though, if you could say a bit about what the storyline is for um, the Asian, Southeast Asian multinationals today in the electronic industry, did they go along the same development path where um, they engaged with multinationals as local indigenous firms and did grow from there? Um, Carol Newman also um, spoke about clustering a lot. I'm also interested in. Uh, uh, the response with regards um, the implications of clustering around a value chain. This is because in small economies you won't have lots of players. Um, you would want competition, but you don't have that many players. So, uh, what are the implications of building clusters around a value chain to the extent that the value chain um, is extends within, you know, downstream, upstream within the country um, before you access the export market? And I was also wondering, um, because there's a lot of skills mismatch that we see a lot of investment in education, but um, in the labor market, you still find skills mismatches. So what would the optimal path be to the development of you know, industry level, relevant cap capabilities, capacities in industries while in the labor force to match industry needs? Thank you. Extreme right end there. Thank you, Antonio Cruz, Mozambique. Um, uh, in Mozambique, uh, the, the, the weight, uh, the share of the manufacturing on GDP went down from 17% in 2004 to about 13% in 2011. 
Uh, Washington Consensus, uh, MDGs, uh, were not very uh, helpful for industrialization in, in Mozambique. Uh, I'm also happy to, uh, to, to observe that as a result of the studies, uh, there is a weak uh, FDI spillover in, in Africa. And, and that, that was also a perception. Uh, and, and another perception is, is that maybe it's important uh, that local companies invest in manufacturing. So the challenge is how to, how to achieve this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, my name is Monal Aratsuma from the South African Treasury. I'm, I'm, I'm still left wondering after, after the session. Uh, I think my curiosity would be uh, what, what would be the best approach uh, to industrialize? I mean, do you go for an export push wherein the market is very unknown, and very uncertain, or do you approach it from an import substitution pro, uh, program, which we have not touched on on this session, in that case where at least the market is known, it's easier to, um, uh, to capture? Or um, do you, uh, or, or, and of course, I mean, once you have figured that out, what would be the most uh, you know, efficient way of support? Do you expose the fiscals uh, to supporting whatever strategy uh, you're going to follow? And most importantly, uh, is this not determined perhaps by the stage of uh, development? Like in a very underdeveloped uh, country, perhaps it's best that you look inward and you go for a strategy that utilizes on a market that exists as dictated by your, 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 your imports and less so about focusing on a perceived market, uh, which is a much more export, to, uh, export push strategy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Now the last two. Hello, uh, I'm from the University of Gothenburg. Uh, I would like to make a point that has been emphasized quite often by Danny Rodrick research that, if I'm right, Vietnam came to industrialization when the WTO still had this domestic content preference. And it's not the case with African country when they came to industrialization. And that may explain why we have a lot of linkages in Vietnam, which is not found in Africa. So my question is that, is there any room that global player like WTO, which then would complain that it's not for development anymore, they're only for trade now play in explaining this picture, or if we just blame the African countries themselves. Thank you. Now, finally, so we can... Uh... Thank you. I'm Sunil Bandhu from, from University of Mauritius. Now, uh, my service is not really my area, so, but uh, I would like just to ask one question, maybe I don't know from the presenters or the research, whether they look at it or not. Now, I think John Page rightly said it, uh, that China has changed the scene quite, quite, quite a lot. And nowadays, when you, when you go and buy things, I mean, I would say, we well, look at it, three quarters of it or more made from China. Now, why I say that? Because one of our colleagues said that um, export processing zone has not been working in Africa. But in Mauritius, we had one of the most successful EPZ sector. But to date, it's in a declining phase, and, uh, and it has contracted by more than 75%. And these firms are moving out, or moving to, to the rest of Africa, and you need to go up the value chain. If you don't go up the value chain, you don't survive. But going up the value chain is not easy. You need new technology, you need better skill labor, and so on. So an issue which, which I've seen some people in the area talking about is equitable trade. Now, uh, what you got to say about this? But how can you compute with China? These guys are telling you that the labor cost is so low and uh, you just can't, can't compete. So you can put it on the, on the policymakers, on the government, but when they're starting, they didn't know about these new challenges and so on. And this issue is coming up in many firms about equitable trade. So I, I'd like to know what are your views on that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the last, last one. Please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Monte Kalwalia from India. Actually, so many questions have been asked that I was strongly tempted to duck. But <laughs> since you've handed me the mic, I had a somewhat different question from what a lot of the others are. Uh, I mean, some very interesting uh, presentations made. And maybe I'm directing this question at uh, John Page. I mean, I agree with the general approach that, you know, if you interpret industrial policy 
to mean that, look, it's not just a case of liberalizing and then waiting for good things to happen. You have to do a lot of things, and you emphasized infrastructure, uh, special economic zones, and skill development, all of which I agree. But you know, I think industrial policy uh, also used to be interpreted. And I think certainly Danny Roderick, whom you invoked a minute ago, uh, did suggest that at one time. That you know, there are some industries that you need to pick up, kind of picking the winners type of approach. I didn't find in any of the presentations uh, a statement about whether the research suggests that that's a good thing or not. Uh, and of course, in large countries that always come, I come from India, so this is always raised, and Danny is usually invoked, so I really want to know what's your view? What does the research of the last 10 years say about countries saying somehow, this is the kind of industry that we need to develop, and therefore let's have some industry-specific incentives. Of course, most countries give very high protection for automobiles, but I'm not counting that. I mean, other than that, uh, when you get into the new technologies, robotics, uh, all of fabs, this, that, and the other, uh, what's a good recommendation that comes out of research? That was my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's have uh, responses. Can we have two minutes each from starting from whom? Who would like to start? Mons? You can respond from there if the mic is working. Okay. Uh, maybe very quick. Uh, I thought they were excellent comments. Let me focus on one or two points that were made about exports. Um, and actually, let me zoom in on this issue uh, of how what does this relationship between productivity and, and exporting actually look like? Uh, the gentleman from Senegal and also witness uh, commented on this. Um, so I think that the, the effect, the relationship is very different depending on the context, right? So when Bernard and Jensen started to look at this thing in, in, in the US back in the 1990s, it was all selection. So you observed a positive relationship between productivity and exporting in the data because more productive firms uh, participated in the export market. I mean, that, that's what drove them into the export market. Uh, if you look at this issue in Africa, in low-income countries, it's the other way around. There is very little or weak evidence that high productivity gets you into the export market, but there's fairly strong evidence that exporting leads to productivity gains. And it's interesting also uh, to look at uh, our case studies on Tunisia and Vietnam, because here you have a bit of both. It's like a virtuous circle. So productivity spurs exporting, but exporting also spurs productivity. So the, the, you know, coming back to what I said earlier, again, uh, you know, the bottom line is that this is pretty, pretty context uh, specific. Uh, I also would like to comment on this issue. So how do we get firms into the to the export market, right? Well, one of the things that we found is that entry costs are very high, okay? So that's a fact that we think we have established. So what do you make of that fact? Well, one kind of naive response to that is to say, well, let's try to reduce uh, entry costs. Yeah, that would be wonderful. But an alternative policy would be to, well, let's uh, focus reforms on areas that are such that firms can grow and therefore accommodate high entry costs, you know? Because the, the, there, are, there are falling average costs, because these costs are primarily fixed. And without further analysis about sort of how did the cost side look here, there's no way you can choose between these two sort of competing policies. So it's, uh, more work mm -hmm. needs to be done. Thank you. John Rand, followed by Carol, and finalizing with uh, John Page. Okay, thank you for the comments. I will also be a little bit selective in... Uh, but uh, I will take up this, and before John steals it, the labor mobility and tra technologies transfers uh, comment. We actually studied this in the, the papers, and this is, uh, I think, one of the results that John likes the most, is uh, that we actually see a lot of uh, uh, labor mobility in these transfers. So we see that uh, labor is uh, previously, uh, previously employed individuals in multinational firms, are actually establishing firms, and they get actually often directly connected as either suppliers or customers of that M&E where they were employed. So we actually see these linkages being very strong in Africa. So this is uh, one of our key results in, uh, that we also have in the forthcoming book, that 
some of these linkages can actually be strongly mobilized through labor, increased labor mobility and facilitating entrepreneurship of new, uh, of new firms, of new African firms, and so forth, credit support and so forth. But you could maybe target previous, uh, previous employees of m and that could potentially be a successful policy, it turns out. So that was a very uh, good question, I think, and it, there is uh, much more in the book about this. Then about the dis differential effects of uh, due to sector differences, that was uh, Justin's uh, comment. Uh, there's no doubt about that the type of M&E or uh, M&C is, is critically important. But our study actually showed we focused in on the manufacturing sector, leaving out these uh, uh, mineral resource-rich uh, countries. Uh, we have them in, but we do not focus uh, so much on this, and that may reduce the linkages uh, that we find a little bit, uh, a little bit of a bias in the results. But other studies have shown that linkages from the mining sector, is, they are very weak. This is from the manufacturing sector, and we just confirmed that the linkages are very weak. So we're actually confirming the results from the mining sector, at least. But it's a, a topic that we need to explore more. Um, there were a question, there's a question about this. Did Asian countries go through the same process of lack of linkages? Uh, in the, and you referred to electronic sector in the beginning. Uh, I can only cite some of our colleagues from uh, the, the, the experience from Malaysia. Um, I think it actually com is combined with Antonio's comment a little bit that it also depends on how you structure ownership of these M&Es, how many linkages will uh, be transferred to the domestic economy. We have been a little bit too hands-off, I think, in actually demanding that M&Es have a joint ownership structure when they're entering uh, developing countries. I know it's not, I will, I will take that on my part, but I, I think we could actually demand more of an m and when they enter uh, a lot of developing country settings and demand something about joint ownership, especially for lower income countries, to generate these spillovers. Did we see that in Malaysia? In some sense we did, yes. So we could actually demand more of the m and in the African setting, in my view. Um, the final one, picking winners. I, I actually like this uh, because if we, and I will just cite Hausmann and Hidalgo, uh, their work, uh, and Danny Roderick as well, in the initial work of their economic complexity and linkages literature. They are actually stating, yes, we can pick winners, but we need to pick the industries that has the most linkages to the remaining economy. So it's not the same industry in every country. It's the, it's the industry that is best, most linked to other domestic firms in the economy. Do we have Methods for doing this? Yes, we do. Has it been done in uh, a lot of countries? No, it hasn't. So we have a lot of work to do in identifying linkages to pick the winners, in my view, to generate these uh, spillover effects. Thank you very much. Carol? Thank you, and Thank you for all of the questions and comments. I'll be very quick so we can give the last word to, to John. I'll just answer the specific question about clustering that was asked by... by um, witness and by, by another speaker. Um, so whether or not it makes sense to cluster around a value chain, um, or whether or not it makes sense to have clusters of similar firms within the same same zones. And I think that, again, it comes back down to context. So in, in our work now, we didn't, I should say, we didn't look at SEZs specifically. We looked at the whole distribution of firms in a country and looked at the pattern of clustering, developed clusters around them, and then looked at, um, looked at what was happening inside. So in Ethiopia, for example, the knowledge transfers are happening between similar firms, whereas another contexts like Vietnam, they're happening between firms in different sectors. So it really matters and it really depends um, on the context that you're dealing with. So in order for the value chain, clustering around a value chain, for that to really work, I think it comes back down to one of our fundamental um, conclusions in all of this is that it depends on the firm capabilities. Are the capabilities there for firms to actually benefit from those, um, those linkages within, within those clusters? So I think I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Now, John, you can fill any gaps and uh, wind up, please. In, in two minutes, right? Uh, so let me half, just, let I me can just, give you a half a minute more. Let me just speak to, to, to three points <laughs> and then fulfill my obligation, uh, which my old friend Paul Collier tells me is that you never go to a public event without a shameless book plug. So uh, if I forget, Carol, kick me, and I'll do the shameless book plug at the end. Um, three things. 
one thing that didn't emerge so much from the discussion today but comes very clearly um, from the body of the research is, and since we're in the mood of nostalgia and looking back 30 years, what I might call chinnery patterns rediscovered. It turns out for many of these issues, learning by exporting, your level of per capita income actually influences the way in which this takes place. Um, for example, the reason why people dismissed learning by exporting is mainly based on advanced country, as, as Mon said, uh, results. We find in middle income countries mixed results. What I think is interesting about our work here is that for low income countries, we find quite strong evidence of learning by exporting, which again sort of moves me back in the direction of saying, well, one of the things that's been a stylized fact of the international trade literature has been that relationships, again, vertical value chain relationships between demanding buyers and firms in developing countries quite often convey firm capabilities. And so I think we haven't yet understood fully the mechanisms of learning by exporting, but we do know they vary across countries, which means, again, context is specific, not just country by country, but also according to level of income. Agglomeration is a very similar thing. It turns out that urbanization economies, apparently, you know, being in a city, are more important in higher technology industries and in richer countries. And localization economies, and kind of near everybody who does something similar to what you do, are more important in low-income countries. That has to be set off against the competition issue, because in lower income countries, it tends to be a more localized market and more competition, driving me in the direction of saying, well, maybe you need an export-oriented spatial industrial policy at low levels of income. But again, context is specific. So the Chenery patterns matter, and we've teased out a few, I think, which is, which is useful. The question on the WTO raised, to my mind, a broader issue, which is, is the international governance structure well set up to help support this industrialization effort in Africa? And my answer would be no. First of all, the two most important players in the game, um, the EU and the United States, have quite dissimilar preference programs for imports of, of African products. Um, they should be harmonized, they should be regularized, and they should be made as generous as possible. They should be time-bound, of course. But there's no reason why AGOA and the Economic Partnerships Agreements couldn't be brought together and made more rational. Then there's the third big player, which is China. I think China has an important role to play in terms of leading in Asia, making its bilateral preference systems much more transparent and open in terms of what people are getting access to Chinese markets, and in leading Asia a bit if we're going to stay in a world of regionalization. And finally, the WTO itself, um, getting a new definition of what constitutes a country eligible for practices, a least developed manufacturing economy definition, would be quite useful, but probably is, at least at the moment, a bridge too far. And then finally, Montek's question about picking winners. I mean, here I'd take slight difference with, with John in the sense that my reading of Danny's recent work is to suggest that, in his mind, this process of what he calls self-discovery, which is, in a sense, allowing um, individual entrepreneurs to identify where your comparative advantage is, um, has come to reduce his view on the selectivity issue and the idea that you can pick one or two industries. I think, again, it may be well related to um, the level of income. If you're worried about the middle income trap in a country like South Africa or in India, you've got to deal with a very different set of priorities for industrial policy than if you're worried about just getting some industry in a country like Tanzania or, or Kenya. So some more subtle thinking there. But I think what we came to the view of is that at the very minimum, you need to know where you're going and you need to have a strategy and it needs to take a broader view of what the role of government is than is currently at least the flavor of the month with the World Bank, the IMF, and, um, and the donor community in, in Africa. And finally, the shameless book plug. For those of you who are interested in kind of the bigger story, including things like what do you do if you have a lot of natural resources, there is a book coming out from Brookings Institution Press. It's called Made in Africa. Um, it will be on the market late this year or early next year, but we will have copies of the book in December in case somebody's organizing an event and would like someone to come along and you know talk about it. We have a second book coming out from Oxford University Press, um, which will be in the spring of next year, uh, called Manufacturing Transformation. And it contains the 11 country case studies, along with an introduction and, and the synthesis chapter. And then finally, a shameless plug for another wider project, which is that we hope to have, 
very shortly, a book which is called The Practice of Industrial Policy, which actually looks at business government coordination and communication in Africa and in East Asia as part of a complement to the, the rest of the, the work on learning to compete. So, uh, and, a, and a shameless plug for a special issue for MONS, which is the Journal of African Economies special issue on learning by exporting. So stay tuned for further developments. And I have no doubt that the wider website will be flooding you with advanced information on where, when, and how you can get copies of these books. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. You agree with me that the panel has done a great job and the participants have done a great job. Congratulations. Thank <laughs> you.